Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I am super excited to have you here for a multitude of reasons. The first is a very important, exciting announcement that if you follow me on social media, you may have already seen this. This podcast, the Strategic Travel Entrepreneur Podcast, is a top 5% podcast worldwide. I let myself scream yesterday because I needed to do it. (laughs) I've been working towards that goal for a really long time. And to be able to say that I'm a top 5% podcast is just huge. And I'm so proud of myself for one that I was able like I crushed the goal. And two, I am so grateful to each and every single one of you. Because truly, without you all listening every single week, I know maybe not every single week, but tuning in when you can, sharing this when you're with your colleagues, writing an amazing review or sending a rating, participating in any of the events that I ever put on, like this truly would not be possible because yes, I do a lot on the back end, but I really am fueled by you. And so I just have such immense gratitude. The one part of me is like, yeah, you did it. And then the other part of me is like, "Ah, I did it because you guys are there for me. And I am just so incredibly appreciative. So truly, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I am going to relish this before I start thinking about the next calls because this this took a lot of time and not saying that I'm slowing down or anything um, and I still have big dreams and things like that. But um, it, it is also important to relish when, when we did it. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the first big thing. Then the second big thing this week is obviously the topic of this week's podcast. If you've been around here, you kind of know when I do an audio series, the podcast after it going officially live is a snippets episode, and this is what this will be. So if you would like to tune into the whole Alternative Careers in Travel audio series, you will need to purchase that. It's just $9, and I'll go ahead and I'll put the link uh, below so that you can get a hold of that. It is chock full and you're going to hear snippets of some like juicy parts of the episodes. But if you have been debating a different career, if you've been kind of like, okay, I would like to monetize my travel business in a different way, or maybe you know somebody who's kind of interested in coming into this industry, but maybe not doing exactly what you do, this is going to be a really great series to tune into. And especially like we are running the gamut here. So we're starting off with travel coaching. Then we're going to virtual assistants, business development manager, aka BDMs, travel writing, travel advisor, destination management company, DMC, travel blogging, and travel podcasting. Because I know uh, lots of us kind of like go in and out of different careers within the travel industry. So it's really cool to kind of see see that bit of a setup, I feel like there's going to be, and and you'll hear it a little bit more, this is really great if you're newer or you have been in the industry for a while and you're not quite sure how everything works together. Hopefully this gives you a better idea that the travel industry is bigger, is wider than the immediate what we see in the travel agent, travel advisor space. So that is big announcement number two is that that went live. And then three, big three announcement. I have actually never done this before. I am going to be doing a trial of marketing business school, which means that you get to come in on the other side of the doors with us and the members that we have inside of marketing business school. You just pay for the one month of marketing business school. You don't get on any membership plan unless you would like to continue with us. So it's really like no risk. 
you get access to the three main calls that we have in September, which is going to be Tech Talk. We also have the Marketing Masterclasses about speaking on your expertise, so public speaking. And then we also have our Q3 quarterly review, which is probably one of the biggest calls that we do. Any of the quarterly reviews where we're reviewing the quarter, seeing what went well, what didn't, and how we can stack up for the last quarter of the year. So that one is going to be a big call. So those are the three calls that you'll be able to participate and what I really would love your input on as being a trial member is I wanna test out some new different call types because we are really changing slash diversifying marketing business school into being the place to take action and to hold yourself accountable for your travel business. So um, I've just kind of learned that we've gotten to a point where we're learning a lot of things within marketing business school, but we're not taking as much action as we should be. And so that really is the next iteration is to get back into that. Like we are going to do the things that we said that we're going to do. And I know members inside Marketing Business School are super excited. So it's gonna be a little bit of experimentation month. So if you would like to join us on some of that experimentation, we would love to have you there. I'm gonna put the link in the show notes so that you can sign up. Again, this is no risk. If after this month trial, you're like, "Mm, not for me, don't worry, you're not gonna be held accountable for anything. If you're like, you know what, I think this is kind of what I need, we are gonna invite you to join us in Marketing Business School, and we're gonna hold you accountable to whatever goals and actions it is that you wanna be taking to have a successful and profitable travel business. All right, those are the big updates, at least that I can remember. So let's dive in to our first episode, first snippet. We're talking with Sahara Rose DeVore. She is the founder of the Travel Coach Network. That name should not be too new of a name to you because I have had her on the podcast a couple times before. And um, we're really diving in deep, not only to like what the basics of a travel coach are in this little snippet, but what are some of these services that you can offer as a travel coach? Like I feel travel coach is really great to have an alternative career, or it's really great to add as a new service to your travel advisor business. So let's tune in. talked about before with travel coaching is that like matchmaking almost and I feel like that's very similar to travel advising in terms of like matching destinations and experiences to whatever it is the outcome where a travel advisor might be like matching things based on what somebody is telling them the travel coaches is, is matching based on these internal emotions and these internal drivers Yeah. So I call this destination or experience matching. Uh, What I've seen in the industry when it comes to tourism marketing, as well as the travel advisor world is um, one, either choosing a destination and or experience, let's say water sports or um, whatever it might be. And dining at a five star certain five star restaurant and promoting that and saying, who wants this? Look how great it is. You know, everyone, you should go here. Well, when you're trying to like throw a net out to a large group of people and seeing who it attracts, right? Mm -hmm. But what we do in travel coaching is we reverse that. We flip the script. So instead of saying, you know, you should visit this place, visit this city, try this, have this experience. We say, what are you, again, what are you looking to get out of this? And I don't mean interests. And this is something else the industry has always done is based off of people's interests, hobbies, Um, what their likes, dislikes are. Those are very, to me, very surface level. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can integrate those into a trip, but that's going to be a little bit of a no brainer. People are going to do what they want and don't want to do. They'll gravitate towards that when they're on the trip. Um, But what I mean by goals and desires needs are below the surface. So I need time alone. I need to self-reflect. I need to heal. I need to grieve. I need to um, you know, make new friends and, and meet and be around people because I've been, you know, and loneliness, loneliness is something in the travel right. industry has been talked a lot about of how people are using tra- 
trips to break the cycle of loneliness, especially after we come out of this pandemic. So I need to be more around people. I, mm-hmm. I want to feel better mentally. I want to, you know, figure out my next steps in my life because I just quit my my long-term job. So that's what I mean about needs, desires, and as- goals and aspirations that people have. Then when you understand that about that client, as the travel expert, we can say, well, consider this destination, this type of destination, this type of experience, because of they are best suited to satisfy and align with what you are looking for. So for example, if someone is looking to heal and, uh, and they're also in, are in a corporate busy work and they're reaching burnout, but they've recently lost their grandmother, mm-hmm. then healing and relaxation, um, connection, immersing into the local culture. These are probably some important things for them. Okay, what mm-hmm. kind of destination offers that? So maybe a place like Bali, where they can spend time in nature because nature is healing. There's a power blue and green spaces. Um, maybe it is um, healing through not only nature, but all of the the holistic remedies that are available there. Maybe it's mm-hmm. spiritual wellness that they need. And, um, you know, Bali has that to offer because of the local culture and they place the little, um, you know, prayer things out every morning, um, the local culture where they can, you know, connect with other people that are outside of their norm. They need a new environment and a break in routine. Um, and it's so different, but yet there's a lot of other travelers who are like-minded to them where they can have a community aspect. They can, Mm -hmm. you know, meet other people and, and build their social, um, social skills. Um, despite, you know, and, and helps them overcome this, this sense of burnout. So that's what I mean by destination or experience matching, Mm -hmm. understand those true needs and desires and say, as the expert, what kind of destinations and what kind of experiences should they be having that are best set that could best satisfy what it is that they realize they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of this is like, it's best if you have almost like personal experience, either with the background of what's going on with the person or with the destination so like that the matching can happen I feel like that's probably like the biggest difference is where you might not necessarily need to know you can find information about a destination online and all that but it's those internal things that really it's you have to have been there or lived through something in order to be able to relate it with the person that you're assisting yeah, I mean, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of travel. There's a lot of what I say noise in the travel industry. There's right. a lot of blogs and and websites and companies talking about the the logistics of a place. And the, again, going back to the features and the amenities of whether it's a property, a hotel, a destination, yeah. uh, or whatnot. But people, those things. Don't, tell me how much nightlife or how many five star restaurants are in town or how many um you know popular hotels are, are available or how many you know, sites, sites there are to see is not going to tell me that it would align with my healing journey. So Mm -hmm. using that personal, the emotional appeal to travel into marketing is something that I constantly talk about Mm -hmm. that I don't see in the travel industry. Thank you so much, Sahara, for joining us. I know Sahara was just one of many of our speakers who was super excited for us to be creating this audio series for you because we were all like, we wish that this was around when we were looking in the travel industry and looking for careers. So finally, there is a resource for people who are looking in the travel industry and looking just for alternative careers that may not be in alignment with what the norm or or might be a little bit different, especially as we're talking about like careers in in 2024. If you're interested in learning more, obviously tune into the full series, but you can also listen to these past episodes with Sahara, episode 68, Travel Coaching for Your Travel Business, and episode 114, Using Traveler Motivations in Your Marketing. So now we're going to go over to our next career. We have two speakers in 
this one. So huge thank you to Carla Fritz from SF Virtual Solutions and Melissa Erskine of iDreamTA Solutions. They are both virtual assistants within the travel industry. Um, really great friends of mine. Also, we're always like kind of troubleshooting on the back end and, and brainstorming together. So I am super excited for you to learn a little bit about what it is to be a virtual assistant in the travel industry. You know, we, we enter the trips into their CRMs. We do some invoicing. Some of us track commissions or call suppliers and change things. Some of us do research. Some of us do some concierge stuff, making the um, dinner reservations or checking that the VIP letter is there at the hotel waiting. Some of us do social media. Some mm -hmm. of us write content. Some of us help with marketing if you're really good with marketing strategy because mm -hmm. that's another area where most travel advisors are not real strong in. Some of them are, right. but most of them aren't. And, um, you know, maybe making graphics for their social media in Canva or Photoshop what is it? Photoshop? Mm -hmm. Yes, Photoshop's you can tell yeah. I don't do that part. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so there's there's all kinds of different directions you could go with it. I mean, if you just want to write newsletters and blogs for, for another travel advisor, mm -hmm. there's plenty of space for that. Or if you just want to do like I do, I just do itinerary. At this point, I just do itineraries and other things um, involved with Travify's itinerary builder, which okay. is by now is getting built out. But there's there's all kinds of things that a, a VA can do. Okay. Mm -hmm. What either of you, what skills are you thinking kind of differentiate a virtual assistant from maybe some of the other careers that might be in travel, whether that's like a BDM, a business development manager, a travel advisor, maybe a DMC? I think, um, yeah, go ahead. I, I was going to say that, you know, doing, being a VA allows you to hone in the skills that you are good at mm -hmm. or that you like. You know, I started doing, as I mentioned before, some social media stuff for friends, but mm -hmm. realized that really isn't my actual forte. Mm -hmm. And it's not something I do very often anymore and realized I actually enjoy other areas. So as I got to, to do that, so Whereas a, a BDM or a, a DMC and stuff, they may have a lot of things within their 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 arsenal that they have to provide. I can pick and choose as a business owner, a virtual assistant business owner, mm -hmm. what services I want to offer or don't want to offer, as the right. case may be. Um, working with the trends of what travel and what are agents needing, um, kind of fulfilling their need of what they what they want, but also it allows me to work as much or as little as I want. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm having a heavy time within my own travel business right. and I lighten up my load or you no, know, I've got some time and room to, for growth or to take on new clients. Then I can do that if I want. Um, it has allowed me to travel. So for this summer, we're going away for three, just over three weeks. Um, you know, I prepare all my agents for that, but it allows me to do that and I can work as I will when I exactly. when I go to Europe. So that that allows me to do some of that kind of thing and not be tied necessarily because it is my own business. Therefore, I direct what it is that I need right. versus working for somebody else, which is what I think we a lot of people wanted to do is is actually kind of working for themselves, not behind a desk, like Carla said, not behind, although I work at a desk, it's my own desk, right. not a company or a corporate <laughs> desk. <laughs> exactly. So. And a desk can mean. Or it could many. be the beach. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I have. <laughs> the desk can mean many things. It has meant balconies on cruise ships for me before. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Your desk can be anywhere. So I think that's what, you know, we bring that's a little mm -hmm. bit different than um, doing other things. And other people like that. They want that structure of a, a job that is nine to five or, or they like those in-person meetings and, and events that they can do with their agents you know it, it it's just the nice thing is it's something for everybody and there are lots of options out there so mm -hmm. people can find what matches for them the best mm -hmm. 
In this episode, I get a bit, um, I don't want to say testy, (laughs) but I do get super passionate about compensation when it comes to virtual assistants. So if you're kind of wondering about that hot button topic or that hot take that I have, definitely tune in. You can also tune in to episode 112, The Real Cost of Hiring and Training and Travel, because I do go over just a little bit, or maybe a lot of it, (laughs) in that episode that I recorded last year. So that is super helpful just to get a realistic idea and opinion, or like my opinion <laughs> on what things should be costing within the travel industry. Um, the next career that we're going to be talking about, as I pull up my notes real, real quick, is going to be business development manager. And I feel like this one gives huge insights into a role that many of us work with super closely. Um, I feel like this is sometimes a misunderstood what actually this role is. So Debbie Horia, I always mess up her name, Horileño, no, Horileño, (laughs) she is Filipino and I always want to pronounce it like a Hispanic person would, but it is not the right way. So Debbie H, I'm sorry, Debbie, (laughs) for mispronouncing your name because my Puerto Rican wants to come out a little bit. But Debbie actually was a travel advisor first and then got into the BDM role. And that's what this snippet is a little bit about. So stay tuned. And then I started out as a, um, in a travel agency as the executive assistant to the president and to the owner. And I had no idea what I was even getting myself into. I didn't know travel agencies even existed at that time. Um, and I didn't even think that that was something that I even wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that door opened up the travel industry to me had never even, uh, gone farther than like San Diego or San Jose basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, so from there, you know, I kind of saw just the world of travel advisors and the agencies, the agency owner, learning about clients and building that type of relationship. And there were some parts of that where I was like, oh, I could take this love for educating people or helping people and do that here as maybe an advisor, right? Mm-hmm. So Then I kind of transitioned to become a travel advisor. And then I found out that I really don't like planning, Rita. (laughs) (laughs) That's a, that's a key component. (laughs) I really don't like planning if it's not for me or for like, or things that I'm super excited about. Right. And I think my role as an advisor is a little bit different than Mm -hmm. most people that are listening to this. I was an in-house advisor working for the host agency. So I was taking over, you know, lead calls that were coming in. These were not clients that I generated myself or, you know, I'm good at building those relationships with them. uh, Once we got on the phone with one another, but these weren't my friends, family, people that I was like, oh, I'm really excited about this destination, you know? Um, So I think that also kind of went into it, but I was totally missing like, this education part of it. I'm also, you know, having been a musician, like I just love being in front of people. I love the energy that we can like share with one another. And I just wasn't getting that as an advisor. Uh, So, you know, COVID happened. And then this opportunity for business development manager with Globus came very naturally. Mm -hmm. And I had a really good friend in the industry that was like, I know that this is not what you were thinking. You were actually, I was thinking of like becoming an IC. Like I was like, how do I stay in this industry that I love so much? And I only know how to be an advisor. Right. Right. Um, so what other avenues are there for me to do that? Um, and, and one of my good friends came to me and she's like, look, I don't, I know this wasn't really the plan, what you were thinking of, but I think you'd be really good at it. I uh, just, just like give it a shot. And I had no idea coming in, you know, I got hired thankfully, um, by my boss at that time. Mm-hmm. And 
I kind of sat there on my first day with Globus. Um, it's all virtually, right? Because the headquarter office is out in Colorado. I'm here in SoCal. I was like, I really don't know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is this job, you know? And right. just thinking about all those times with my, my own PDMs as an advisor, like, what were they even doing? And mm -hmm. I think as advisors, we only see it for this like face front of you see your BDMs hosting cocktail parties, lunches and dinner, right. or do you see them at uh, all these great conferences and events? And, you know, they're always looking uh, 10 out of 10. Um, and they're so, they're so amazing, like just great personalities to be around. And so I was like, okay, maybe that's really it. Like, I'm just supposed to, you know, like host parties and things. But yeah, exactly. I'm like, all right, I guess I'm like this kind of like influencer or whatever. Um, and it's not that at all. It, it There's a lot of, um, I found my love for education back here being a BM, you know, and the beautiful part of having been an advisor before is that now I have a completely different perspective than most BDMs have mm -hmm. because I know the situations that my advisors are in. Um, I know when they come to me and they say, Debbie, I really want to build my business with you. I just don't know how, and I don't know how to, you know, curate it so that I get those clients. Right. Um, quite honestly, sometimes I don't even know that, but there is, there is this really great thing about being able to partner up with someone and like, just op give open ideas and mm -hmm. give it a sh shot. Right. So yeah. there's this sense of collaboration that goes, goes into it as well. So I really found my, uh, I guess my calling here being a BDM, being a support to my travel advisor partners, because I know at the end of the day, you guys love doing it yeah. uh, because I know I hate, like I said, I hate planning. <laughs> I did not <laughs> like planning. There's a lot of stuff of, about a, an advisor I, like I did not like. Uh, so I know that you guys have to go through that. So for me, I get it. You know, I'm yeah. like, they have to do all these things. How can I help you do a little bit more research or make sure that we are the right fit for these clients? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, and then the education part, like I keep coming back to that, but I found that, you know, I'm not just giving product, uh, just giving product all the time. Like this is Globus Family Brands, Globus Cosmos Avalon. This is what we do. To me, it is more educational. Like, who who is the client like what farther than just the experiences what else can i be educating you on to help right. you with your business um and to realize if we are the right fit for you and your business plan or not so mm -hmm. yeah that's i think in the gist for me in my own experience that is what i see it as as a bdm is uh, number one i'm your partner and number two, I'm here to educate you. I am here to, if you want to further your partnership with me or my company, what can I do to help you do that? Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, it is. Um, and I think that if you're a BDM also listening to this, thinking about being a travel advisor, I think you should try it. <laughs> I think you should try it. Yeah, maybe Get just six months and, <laughs> and you'll have a better understanding and maybe even more empathy for your advisor partners when you when you try to do that, because it is not like planning your own trips. It is completely different, you know, yeah. so kudos to all of my travel advisors. Always. They're like my favorite people on the planet are my travel advisors. <laughs> Thank you so much, Debbie, for all that you do for the travel industry. And um, if you would like to learn more, obviously tune into the whole series, but episode 17. So one, if you are really wanting to look back into the roots 
of like what a top 5% podcaster first started out as a baby podcaster. Episode 17 is going to be a great one. Um, And it is actually about strategizing with your supplier BDMs. So I interviewed, she was with Hertie Gruten at the time. She, I believe, is in space travel, but um, at the moment. Um, But that one is a really great one to really find out like more about like what the relationship is between travel advisor and BDM and how you can use them to really develop your travel business. So our next, why do I do this to myself? I'm always like not prepared going on to the next person. (laughs) The next person that I spoke with was Cheryl Rosen. And that name might be super familiar to so many of you because she is a well-loved travel writer, travel publicist, travel journalist. She calls herself by a lot of different names within the travel industry, but uh, she does have a very famous Facebook group that you can head over and take a look at um, and join because she's always asking for different quotes and insights from the travel industry. So if you've never been published in a publication, that is also a really great way to start getting your name out in the online news space. So without further ado, let's learn more about travel writing from Cheryl. So, I mean, the the key to to good writing, they say, Mm -hmm. is uh, tell them what, you you know, just like the key to good speaking, uh, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them is the key. Mm -hmm. Um, so your lead is really important. The first sentence is the key. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to really make it, you have to tell them what you're going to tell them, you know, like tell them what your story's about right up front. People have like a one minute attention span these days. Right. If they don't like your first sentence, they're not reading it, period. Move on, you know. So you need a really good lead. And I like to have a really good closing sentence so they don't forget about you. Okay. <laughs> and in between doesn't matter that much. Blah, blah, blah. In between, you know, it's nice to really say something helpful. You uh-huh. know, you talk to your audience like professionals. Yeah. Assume they really know what they're talking about because it is one smart bunch of uh, professional women and men in the travel industry. Right. Um, so just think about whether this story, uh, we had a thing at travel, uh, I think it was at Business Travel News. I had a little thing hanging on my wall that said, is it news? Is it true? Is it fair? Those are the three questions to ask yourself. Uh-huh. If you're writing a news story, is it really news? Or you get a lot of press releases where, you know, people send you things and say, oh, new, whatever it is, you know. And you read it, you're like, wait, I know they've had that for like a year and a half, you know. We're announcing the official opening of a new resort, you know, in uh, May 2022. (laughs) Um, Uh, So is it news? If you're writing news, it has to really be new, you know. And when I say news, I mean new. Like I sent somebody yesterday, you know, they send you press release. I say, okay, I'm writing, I I write daily news now a lot for travel uh, research online also. Uh They have news at the top of the page. So to me, news means it happened today or yesterday. After Uh that, it's not news, you know. So every once in a while, I had a story a couple of days ago, and I wasn't sure of the facts, and it didn't come from a press release. I saw it in another magazine. Okay. And that's the other thing they say in journalism is you have to have two sources. So just because you saw it in another magazine doesn't mean you can repeat it, even if it's a magazine you trust. Okay. Uh, you, yeah. know, if, you know, really, you don't know if it's true, you know. So I sent it. I wrote up a thing. I, I sent it to the PR people for the company. I said, I'm writing a new story on this story I saw in another magazine. Mm-hmm. Can you fact check this and just tell me if all my facts are correct? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, by the uh, and to me, it was nine o'clock in the morning. I expect to put, I mean, when I say I'm putting it up ASAP, I mean, like in an hour, you know. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> like a day and a half goes by uh-huh. and they email me back. Yeah, here's, you know, here's what we see. This one thing is, I was like, I posted that like 11 o'clock in the morning yesterday. <laughs> you know? That's so news, news is news. You know, I have right. a weekly column. So maybe it has to wait till Friday, but in general, it has, you know, like to me, it's, it's, if I say it's news, it's new, you know? 
Yeah, no, and I I love that you like brought that up because it reminded me. So I'm in I'm in Rotary International. I I'm in one of my local chapters here. And they have the four-way test. And the two first things on the four-way test are, is it true and is it fair? Uh-huh. I guess we, they all came from the same place, right? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, that's what you want to know, you know, is it true? And then especially because we work in the travel industry and uh, suppliers are our partners. Maybe not, we don't feel that way all the time. Right. But in general, we need each other and we are long-term partners. I like, I don't want to say something negative about a supplier that's not even true, let alone fair. So uh, like, I, I really try to get both sides. And that's the other really good thing about a column, mm -hmm. which is I can make it as long as I want. Right. Where a print like Travel Weekly, I love Travel Weekly. I appreciate everything. Every time they let me write a story for them, I'm mm -hmm. honored by, you know, to be included. But it's, you know, it's a print magazine. You have a half a page, you have a half a page. That's all there is right. to it. Say it in 700 words and that's it, you know. Where in my column, I can include a lot of voices. Mm -hmm. And I think, I really think that's what makes my, that's why people like to read my stuff. Because I interview like a lot of different people for every story. If you can't tell, yes, that is me starting to nerd out. Um, I nerded out with a lot of these episodes. It was just like my inquisitive mind was so delighted just with everything that each of our speakers had to say. So super big thank you to Cheryl for sharing a bit about travel writing for us, which I feel like even if you don't go into that profession of travel writing, there's like a lot of really good tidbits to help you beef up the travel writing that you might do for your travel business as well. Our next speaker is Jackie Friedman, president of Nexion Travel Group. I was going to say she was Nexion Travel Group, which I guess she might be to many people if you know her. Um, Jackie has actually been a dear friend of mine for many, many years. And so this episode, yes, it's about travel advising, but we do take both sides of newbie travel advisors and experienced travel advisors because I know many of you experienced folks would be like, I don't need to learn about this career. I'm already in this career. But what you're going to hear in this snippet, I feel is like a hot topic that a lot of you are going to want to listen in on because I feel like this is a question everybody wants or is going to have at some point within their travel career. So let's head it off to Jackie. When you're thinking about some of the top travel advisors at Nexion, I'm thinking about circle of excellence caliber. Are there like certain skills that are common amongst them? Are they doing similar things and that's what's getting them to the top? Yeah. So a, a few things. First of all, um, they have a goal. Uh, one of the conversations I have with our top producers all the time uh, is they, um, they, are motivated by recognition. They are motivated by having a plan, having a goal and, and uh, meeting and beating that goal. So you need to put it out there and and go after it. So that's at, uh, attribute number one. Mm -hmm. Attribute number two uh, is, uh, you know, just keeping connected with their clients, nurturing their existing client base. Uh, and probably the number one uh, marketing tactic that our top producers um, talk about is referrals uh, and not just asking for a referral when someone comes back, but by asking referrals, always asking for referrals when you make the booking, you know, is there anyone that may want to travel with you on this trip? Mm -hmm. So taking your relationships, leveraging them to grow uh, relationships, uh, okay. you know, number three, uh, they, you know, are well networked. They realize the importance of connecting uh, with their communities by reaching out, uh, whether it's public relations, whether it's volunteering, whether it's uh, different networking groups, but they realize um, how can I make different connections online and offline to right. grow my business? 
not only who do I know, but who do they know that might be able to uh, to help me? So, uh, so they do that as well. Number four, uh, they you know they get to a time in their business where they realize that something has to change. Mm. So, if you are a solopreneur, meaning that you are it that you wear all the hats and you're the only one doing all of the jobs, you're going to get to a point where you run out of hours of the day. Right. So you need to make a decision. Uh, that decision is, am I going to be more selective about what I sell? Uh, what is pros- profitable? What am I passionate about? What do I want to spend uh, most of my time on? And, um, and so be more selective. Or decide, do I want to grow my business by either bringing on um, independent contractors or employees under me, depending on how I want to use them, to expand my business? Mm. Uh, But we see uh, a lot of successful advisors get to that point uh, where they choose to expand their business. And they are very selective in who they bring on. They bring on people that compliment them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you brought up a Disney example earlier. There are people that love selling Disney and there are people that hate selling Disney. Oh, yeah. So if I'm one of those people that hate selling Disney, but I'm getting a lot of Disney requests, then why wouldn't I bring on an advisor that affiliates under me that I can pass my Disney leads on to? Mm-hmm. So how can I grow my agency um, very, very uh, intentionally by um, bringing on folks that may complement what I want to sell. So, uh, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing that as well. Thank you so much, Jackie, for joining us on the Alternative Careers in Travel audio series. I cannot wait to do another podcast with you. Next up is the career of Destination Management Company, which I know many of you work closely with as a travel advisor. This snippet with the founder of Offbeat Travel, or one of the co-founders and the CEO of Offbeat Travel, his name is Harry Alvarez. He was actually on prep for Wave Week last year, if you wanted to tune into that. But we are going to be talking about in this snippet, really the whole travel, not the whole travel industry ecosystem, but if you've kind of been confused about how travel advisors work with destination management companies that work with tourism boards, that work with destination management operators or operations and all those, there's a lot of like a different acronyms that we use. Harry is breaking it down little by little for us in this episode. So enjoy. Some people might get a little confused between, so what makes a DMC different than a travel advisor? And like my head goes to, well, travel advisors use DMCs, especially if they're not like well-versed in a location, because a DMC is more of a subject matter expert. What would you say is like the difference? That's a great, that's a great for a subject matter expert where we specialize in a certain destination. Okay. Um, so a travel advisor might sell 15, 20, 30 destinations. We only focus on our destinations. Which in my case, I specialize in the American Republic in Puerto Rico. I have a partner that specializes in Costa Rica. Okay. They're separate entities, they're separate companies. So then you also go into like the legal compliance of you know, travel advisors typically don't have um subsidiaries formed in every country that they're selling. They don't have like ways of paying employees locally, they don't have kind of that access to the local infrastructure that a DMC would have because they live in those places, you know? Yeah, yeah, because that's, I think that's a a big thing to distinguish because I would also say some people might want to use a travel advisor. Some people might just go directly with you as the DMC and the location. And like, not even just like the general public. I feel like event managers, event planners would yeah, be exactly. services a lot right exactly and we do work with a lot with a, tra- with a lot with travel advisors because what what's the thing with the travel advisors you're typically from where they're from mm-hmm. so there's a certain level of trust in talking to someone who knows where they're coming from uh-huh. whereas 
we're in country, uh, you you may you may not get someone that speaks the language perfectly or understands them as well or or these kind of things. And then travel travel advisors also tend to have keep the clients coming. We only have one destination, okay. whereas you can offer multiple destinations. So you you know the 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 client knows that while in the Dominican Republic. You know, Rita works with Harry because he's off the travel. But what if next year I want to go to Peru? Like, who would Rita recommend in Peru? It's not right. going to be Harry. I don't, I don't know anything about Peru. Right. So, like, the, the different roles, you know? Yeah, yeah, because then that also makes me think about, I feel like I need to, like, create a map or something about how the industry works. Because now I think about tourism boards which yeah. is kind of like in this ecosystem with travel advisors and destination management companies. So how would you say a tourism board is different than what you do? Yeah. So tourism boards are really related. So we work with the tourism board here in the DR. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the process of getting, of becoming a certified, um, but one of the certified tour operators and everything. It's like a long process. Yeah. But as, the, as a DMC or a tour operator, becoming friendly with the DMO the, or the tourism board, the, you know, DMO would be the destination management organization. Mm -hmm. So countries have tourism boards, but even cities have DMOs. Like okay. New Orleans and company in New Orleans has a, its own DMO. Okay. Um, visit Palm Springs, you know, or visit Puerto Rico, you know. Yeah. So, um, the, so they're lying, but the tourism board is in charge of selling the destination mm -hmm. to like all types of travel mm -hmm. so they're like really focused on like global conferences you know global um, tourism expos um you know dmcs are more specialized mm -hmm. so you know my dmc mostly works with sustainable travel uh we don't do resorts and that kind of stuff and there's other dmcs that do that kind of stuff okay um there's also um entire companies like we do a lot of student travel there's also companies that do a lot of like corporate travel, events travel. So there's the like the mice industry, the D, the DMC, they are just mice, for example, which is meetings and conferences and stuff, right? right. So there's different differentiation in the types of DMC. Like my DMC is mostly student travel, uh, family travel, adult travel, and mostly like people looking for an alternative to go to, go to the resort, but it's a little bit different, more like you know, three to four star hotels, eco lodges, where there's DMC that are looking for like high luxury, you know, private yachts, you know, resorts, uh, you know, so there's different levels, different segments, and the, 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 the tourism board covers everything. So what you didn't know is that we were going to take a pop quiz at the end of it. Just just kidding. No pop quiz, but I hope that this like snippet really enlightened you a little bit about how each of kind of like, I feel like it's almost like a trifecta between DMC, Tourism Board, and Travel Advisor kind of all work together to get people traveling more around the world and to different destinations around the world. So thank you, Harry, so much for being here on the audio series. Uh, we're in the final countdown. So the next two speakers. So we have the first one up is going to be Nita Clapperton. She's the founder of She Knows SEO. If you've heard a couple of my earlier S SEOs, <laughs> Episodes, um, you know that I was writing a blog. There is actually a blog for the podcast that is slowly coming out there. And um, it's just based on a lot of the episodes and a lot of like the SEO strategy and implementation that I've done on that is largely due to the tactics that I've learned from Nina. So I'm so excited to share her with you. Stay tuned to the snippet. <laughs> connecting with people and kind of giving them like a helping guide. And it is not about you. You do not matter to these people most of the time, like not in a negative way, just like a lot of them are new to your site or they're super busy. So like the example I often give is that I, one of my first, not probably like my 
top one of my first 10 articles was what I'm most excited to do in Singapore. Mm-hmm. Do you care what I'm excited to do in Singapore? No, like, cause it doesn't matter to you. Like it, what right. you care about or what are the exciting things to do in Singapore? And you probably care about it more after I've done it and uh-huh. can report back on it and tell you yeah. if it actually is exciting. So I find that like with blogging, it is writing typically longer form content. I wouldn't write a blog post under about a thousand words, which I know sounds like a lot, but when you have a really clear topic and you're kind of creating these like mini help guides on this one very specific subject, you can like, I've written them about like the Crocs that I have for my dog. And it was like (laughs) 3000 words. Cause like (laughs) you think of every question someone has about those Crocs and you build it in, you're like going really in depth. And so with travel, one of the misconceptions I think with the blog side is that, yeah, it is, it's about you and it's a diary of your trips and it's for people who already know you. No, this is for your ideal audience. So you want to start figuring out like, who is the person that you're talking to? Who is this person? What are their pain points? What do they struggle with? And typically they're not you. They might be you a few years ago, but like, for example, my initial site, it used to be solo female travel. And then I kind of pivoted it to living abroad. But the, one of the reasons I made that pivot is that like, I was like, oh, everyone's just lived abroad. Like I moved to Italy alone at 16. I was like, that's a normal thing to do. Turns out, no, it's not. No. But I, I didn't realize that because I'd done it. So I was like, okay, oh. you just have to, you just do it. You just find a weird, sketchy Italian guy on the internet. And then so, <laughs> it was genuinely like, my mom and I had a conversation recently and I was like, you should not have let me go to that. And she yeah. was like, you oh, were yeah. really confident. So we just did it. And I was like, yeah. cool. <laughs> but I wouldn't have thought that someone else would struggle with that. Uh-huh. And so you're, you have to think that it's probably you at the beginning of your journey, or it's someone that's maybe a step below you at the beginning of your journey where they need help even getting to that point. So mm-hmm. a lot of people like with, like, let, I always give the example of Italy because most people like have heard of it or know of Rome. And mm-hmm. I'm like, someone going to Rome. One of the things I see most often is like, okay, I don't want to get pickpocketed. Like, how am I going to deal with that? Or it's like, what's the best time of year? Most of us want to start more from a point of like, let's examine this one really amazing restaurant I did, or let's examine like this one really amazing thing that I did that I really loved. Mm -hmm. Okay, They're not ready for that yet. Like, they're like, no, no, no. I want to know if I should go in July or not. Don't (laughs) just run in July. But like, it's, but they wouldn't know that. And so I often say like, there's no stupid questions with blogging. It's just like, people don't know. Like I, I would like to think I'm very smart. I have a master's degree. I have two undergrad degrees. I've run like, now I have two different multi six figure businesses. Still, I didn't know where Puerto Rico was. <laughs> I just, I didn't, it <laughs> never occurred to me to consider it. I didn't know that Mexico was like in continental North America. Cause mm-hmm. again, I never considered what that is. It just, it was a, an irrelevant piece of knowledge to me. I'm like, I know physically where it is. I've been there a number of times. What, who cares what continents it's, it's on or who cares what it's grouping is. And so always remember that like people are not dumb. They're asking questions because they want help. So mm-hmm. you're going to write these posts to help them with that thing. And yeah. then you want to also connect that content. So blogging is not writing a bunch of like, I don't know, it basically like making icebergs and setting them all adrift. Like, okay, here's 10 ice cubes floating in the ocean now. What's the yeah. point of that? Like, what is that? Yeah. That's not helping the person stranded on like <laughs> the boat in the middle or something. <laughs> you go back to like Frogger days of like hopping on ice blocks. <laughs> like what you want is to line it all up so that it all points to something. Mm-hmm. And that's where you're going to interconnect things. So with blogging as well, like most of it comes down to helping a person. And I always think of it of helping a single person on a single journey with each kind of like cluster or people call them pillars, people call them silos. I don't care what you call them with each like kind of batch of content is like, okay, we're going to plan a full trip to Rome. We're going to plan a full trip to Italy for this specific type of person for these specific types of questions. And along the way, they're gathering knowledge So they're getting it more advanced. So we can write those posts that are like, Mm -hmm. here's this great restaurant to eat at. And to preempt, I guess, a question I think people probably have is, but like, if I'm giving away the milk for free, is that a problem? No. So, well, first off, thank you, Nina, so much for being a part of the Alternative Careers in Travel audio series. I know we're talking a lot about the different careers, but what you don't 
really here, and we're going to kind of touch on this one in our last episode about travel podcasting, is I very much bring up ways in the different episodes of how you can generate revenue, especially when we're talking about things like Nina's episode blogging, you think of it as writing. So how can you monetize your writing? And so we do go into the different avenues. And I know many of us like you're going to hear, I don't know if we actually talking about about it in like this snippet with my next speaker, but um, we do talk about like how people have multiple different streams of income. I know Nina will, I asked her point blank, like if we were look to look at a, a pie graph, like what are the different pieces in the pie graph? And so she was very transparent. So just really, really great episodes if you really are looking for the nitty gritty on how to make money within the travel industry. So without further ado, let's get to our last amazing speaker and Please send any shout outs to the speakers if you have enjoyed any of these snippets or have enjoyed listening to them on their full episodes in the audio series. They have been like just so generous with their time and helping to promote the series that I'm sure they would love to hear from you just like I love to hear from you when you love these episodes. So without further ado, this is Danielle Desir Corbett and we're talking all things podcasting. What you need to have is an engaged audience, quality content that's helpful, entertaining, that provides something to your listeners and figure out the business model that you're passionate about that works for you. Right. I, I want to go down more through that lane of like the monetization part, but I know some people are like, okay, I'm kind of like intrigued at this but what am I supposed to talk about? And I know you had mentioned like, go to what what written content, but now that you've kind of gotten into the flow, like what inspires you to kind of like direct the content that you're putting out? So I would start by asking yourself, okay, what are my three to four main content pillars? So content pillars are kind of like the buckets that you would put all of your content into. And usually I recommend anywhere from three to four buckets so that you have some versatility, diversity. You're not always kind of stuck in talking about one thing. So what are those four different buckets that you can talk about over and over and over on your show, but it's a cohesive brand. So for me, I talk about affording travel. So that can look like saving money, travel hacking, tips, and all of that kind of stuff. That's my affording travel bucket. I also have a paying down bucket, like pay down, pay down student loans, pay down loans, paying down mm-hmm. credit cards, that kind of thing. Um, I have a bucket about building wealth. So if you look at my catalog of nearly 200 episodes, you could probably pinpoint which of those buckets that episode falls into. Okay. And things have evolved over time. Like I actually don't talk about debt as much anymore, but I do destination deep dives on the podcast a lot more, like storytelling episodes a lot more. So you can change over time. You could change your mind always as a creator, but having those three to four buckets really keeps you focus narrow. And now you become really well known for a handful of things. I I love that you mentioned that because I always like to put the analogy of like, put the blinders on. I always think about the Clydesdale horses and where they have the the blinders on because it makes it so much simpler instead of like thinking about the world. Okay, we're thinking about a destination or we're thinking about a country or a vehicle of travel. Um, When you do, like going back into monetization, when you do start thinking about content, Is that how you figure out what sponsors you want to be pitching to? Or is it kind of in reverse? Maybe are sponsors pitching to be on the podcast or to have a feature? Majority of my brand partnerships, I am behind the scenes pitching them, reaching out to them, proposing stories, proposing partnerships. So a lot of that creativity is going to come from me and getting them on board, of course, is important. There are times though, and especially as I continue to grow, there are more brands that reach out to me and they're like, Hey, we love what you're doing. We would love for you, for us to partner together. Right. And in that situation, 
I'm reversing where it's like, okay, based off of the brand, your marketing goals and what you're promoting, what kind of topics would be relevant for my show and what episodes can I can create as a result of that, right? Again, that theme of every episode I create, I want it to be helpful. So I will always want my content to be helpful and I can naturally infuse the brands into that. So I think it just Mm -hmm. depends. But a lot of my job right now is pitching, meeting brands, coming up with proposals, coming up with ideas. Like just before our call, I was scripting out an episode that I have coming out in a couple of weeks, right? Um, So that's a huge part of that, of that role and job. But again, that's the, what I love to do. Like I love the behind the scenes work and my, my product is my content. Like I love that business model. I do not have a business model where I'm promoting courses or experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's very different. And you have to really figure out like, which model do you like and which one do you want to go all in on? Cause then you'll be so much more successful. And that is a wrap on this episode. So what did you think? Let me know. Send me a text. I would love to hear your thoughts about these snippets and the alternative careers in travel and how you can monetize your travel business. Again, there's going to be all sorts of links for you to join and do all the things that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. And another again like just huge thank you for being here and sharing I know this was a bit of a longer episode so maybe you like split it up just a little bit but I appreciate you being here and uh, I will see you on the next one